The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Assalamu alaikum. Hello and welcome to all of you in today's session on Benami Transactions Prohibition Rules. This is in continuation of our last session on Benami Transactions Prohibition Act 2017. Um, just bear with me for a second. Let me turn on my cam so you guys can see me as well. I hope you can all see me now. Okay, let's proceed. So today's session on the rules basically form the essential part of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act's practicality. We covered that in the last session and did mention about the rules uh, which are to be covered in today's session. So first things first, um, a warm welcome to all of you in today's session. On behalf of uh, the entire team, uh, ACC has organized this CPD to ensure that during these times you can invest on, in yourselves, keep yourself up to date, and especially in this important arena that's been constantly mentioned by our members uh, regarding the local laws and taxation, we can work to actually enhance your skills. Is my voice quality fine? Nizam, can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pardon? Sound audio is perfectly clear. Okay, just bear with me for a sec. Let me adjust the fan settings. Okay, guys, uh, back with you. First things first, let's begin with the, the formal intro. Uh, by now, as a result of you attending various CPDs and more so the current ongoing CPD program, uh, I'm sure many of you would already be aware uh, of my introduction, but still, for those who are attending for the first time, I will briefly introduce myself. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Rabbash Rahli Sadri, Wa Yasserli Amri, Wa Ahluk Tatimil Lesani, Yafka Hukauli. O Allah, open my heart and ease my task for me and remove the impediments from my speech so that they may understand what I say. My name is Omar Zahir Mir. I'm honored to be the chair of ACCS MNP and Taxation Subcommittee. I also sit on the editorial board of ACCA's regional pub uh, publication, Policy Insights, for the entire Middle East and South Asia region. I'm also part of several other initiatives of ACCA, including the Professional Experts Forum, the Mentors Group, at, uh, the Six Digit Program, etc. I'm also honored to be representing Pakistan on the Global Tax Forum, too. Um, in addition to this, I'm a life member, twice serving current chairman of Finance and Economic Affairs Liaison Committee of Lahore Tax Bar, and previously have served four time as the chairman of the Liaison Committee of the same. Uh, I'm also honored to be sitting on the board of several think tanks and corporate entities. Um, I'm a fellow chartered certified accountant, CFA charter holder, uh, chartered accountant, BFP, CPFA, with any anti-money laundering, fraud risk management specialization, and several other certifications. Uh, professionally, uh, have 17 years plus fund of experience gained by working in top management positions, both abroad as well as in Pakistan. Presently, in addition to sitting on the board of several corporate entities, I'm mainly the managing partner for taxation and corporate services at Millennium Law and Corporate Company, MLCC, which happens to be the pioneer ACC practicing and law firm in Pakistan. My portfolio as a trainer includes having conducted mandatory promotional trainings of government officers at MPDD, professional trainings at the likes of uh, National Bank of Pakistan, HPL, MCB, PPCBL, Lahore Karachi Tax Bar, Pakistan Tax Bar, Lahore Karachi Chambers, IBP in collaboration with the State Bank of Pakistan, Barrier University, UET, last but not the least, are very on ACCA. And I'm also a regular contributor uh, with my articles being published in various English language dailies on these technical subjects, uh, which you can always um, find on my blog site, umazahirmeer.wordpress.com. So that's pretty much about me. Let's move forward. Uh, 
I'm going to skip the next few slides showing the existing clients association listing of academic professional qualifications and major strengths as well as MLCC's intro. Um, uh, but do check out this link in the presentation that you'll be getting. Uh, this is something uh, we are very humbled by and something that can serve as a huge motivating factor for you guys. Um, our firm MLCC was profiled by ACCA and it was published uh, a report on it was published so do have a look on this and uh, if you are planning to come into practice and need any guidance feel free to contact professional acknowledgement several legislations and other reports of the fpr and mlcc uh, have been used in the development of today's presentation due to limited time and the extensive volume of the topic we'll strive to cover the maximum possible content within the available time However, if needed, the content coverage will be prioritized to suit the requirement and constraints of today's sessions. Okay, guys, so Benami Transaction Prohibition Rules 2019. Before we proceed, in the last session and previously in some sessions, we have discussed the relationship of the act or ordinance with the rules. So, why not have some feedback from our learned attendees today? What do you guys think is the relationship of rules with regard to the main body of the law? Why do we even need the rules and what purpose do they serve? Uh, you can type your feedback in the Q&A box or the chat box that you have in the relevant panel. So Rashid Hanif, your name is still appearing as Radid Hanif, but I remembered you. So I do remember your name is Rashid. In the next registration, just be careful. I just sort this out. Uh, so Rashid is saying rules are also a type of a law or something like that. Okay. Nizam. <laughs> your domain my friend please read all the comments and the name of our learned participants okay rashid hanif rules are also a type of a law or something like that uh, hafiz muhammad Fessel, rules define execution and ordinance or act are general laws mm -hmm. uh, amna semi Rules are the detailed procedures available, practical implication, implementation of the act. Mm -hmm. Adil Nasir, for practical understanding of the ordinance, rules have to be understood. Rao Ali Zishan, laws are the ideals and proclamations in principle. Rules are the nut and bolts, and the steps for executions. Mohammed okay, Ali Sami. Very interesting example. Please carry on. Me rules provide practical steps in order to implement law. Uh, Sakib, Muhammad Sakib, how to comment? You are already commenting, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Sakib, just like Ashish. you write, uh, hang on. Sakib, just like you wrote how to comment, you can just write your comment there. Ask your question there or give your feedback there. Please carry on. Rashid Hanif, rules are details detailed description of any ordinance or fact thank That's you all uh, moments okay uh sakibali rush the rules are the procedure of laws to be implemented and uh, saad bin khalid rules are sops for implementation of acts okay the good thing is many of our members uh, especially those who attended the last session have retained uh, and have a good concept of what rules are for, which is fantastic. Yes, rules shows the practical implica implications. And I gave an example last time, citing that it's not uh, like for like, and um, it's not even remotely similar, but because uh, we belong, most of the attendees belong from a certain culture. So things are better understood in the cultural context. And then I gave you uh, the example of the injunctions in the holy quran and then their elaboration in the hadith so um, it's nothing similar again a disclaimer but just only for the purpose of understanding the concept 
the main law only give you the law the injunction and the rules tell you how to go about the practicalities and the modalities how the things would actually work so let's go back to our presentation uh, and by the way while i'm gonna be continuing with the presentation please download the benami prohibition rules 2019 that have been provided in the handout section and the copy of today's presentation you would need to refer to them if you have any problem just type in your chat box and uh, our support team would be happy to provide you the links for the direct download but please open them at your end so you'll be comfortable referring to what i'll be talking still i'll be opening the uh, prohibition rules myself on the screen while sharing with you so that should still be comfortable for you anyway the benami transactions prohibition rules were introduced on 11th march 2019 so almost two years after the act came into force the rules were introduced and these rules were enforced with immediate effect so the practical modalities started happening on the 11th of march 2019 and what happened practically was that um, FPR's Inland Revenue Service uh, tasked the BTB broadening of text-based zones uh, with the duty to investigate and thereafter establish cases regarding Benami properties. And the aim was that this should lead to the submission of chalans to the adjudication authority within 120 days. We have previously read about having 90 days period after the show cause notice um, and then the further 30 days period. So the total time period for submission of Chalan to the adjudication authority is 120 working days. So during this period, the sale, purchase and transfer of property will normally be stopped till further orders. Appeal against any adverse decision of the adjudication authority can be lodged with the federal tribunal. <laughs> excuse me and after the decision of the federal tribunal such properties will be confiscated pay attention and sold out by the federal government furthermore if the crime of benami transactions is proved the confiscation is not all we have read about this and discussed about this in the last session when i say yesterday that refers to the previous session so we discussed there that there are three pronged punishments to say the least uh, the confiscation of the property the imposition of the fine and the prosecution with possible jail terms so that's exactly what's been referred here so furthermore if the crime of penami transaction is proved criminal proceedings will be initiated against accused persons and where proven guilty rigorous imprisonment of one year to seven years can be awarded to such person and remember we also discussed in the session on the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act, that similarly any person providing false and baseless information can also be sentenced to rigorous imprisonment of six months to five years. So, another thing that we briefly referred to in the Act session, and which we, you should keep in mind, is that uh, the concept of whistleblowers was introduced. I believe being qualified professionals, chartered, certified accountant, you'll all be aware of what a whistleblower is. So let those comments come in. Let me see what you guys think. I'll be giving you guys about a minute to type in your responses. Nobody knows what whistleblower is. How to comment? Sakib Sahab, you can comment the same way you are already doing, where you are typing how to comment. That's exactly where you'll type in your comment. Okay, guys, I'll wait 10 more seconds and then I'll answer this myself, assuming that all our learned participants, unfortunately, do not know what a whistleblower is. Okay, someone is typing. 
So let's see. Uh, you need to be quick because it's a time constraint session, so we can't law wait for much longer. Okay, so I'll just continue. Um, a whistleblower is basically someone who tips off about some wrongdoing. So um, in this regard about the Benami that we are talking about, in this context, the whistleblowers will be rewarded, will be entitled to a cash reward for providing credible information leading to detection and confiscation of a Benami property or transaction. So the uh, benefit normally is about 5%. So if a property is worth uh, 2 million or less, 5% of the price of the Benami will be given to the informer. If the property is worth more than 2 million, then it would come down to 4%. That would be given to the informer. And where the value is more than 5 million, only 3% would be given. But think about it. If it's like um, a property, an average property in a good location, um, Mm, three to five crores so that means three crore into three percent do the maths there you go not bad anyway uh, there are some conditions number one it is clarified that this award will be given only if the information provided is of value and FBR doesn't already have it if they already have it no sorry you don't qualify if they don't have it but it doesn't lead somewhere sorry hard luck and if the information is already in public record sorry hard luck and um, if the appeal against confiscation of property doesn't attain finality or goes against the department sorry hard luck so it's only after they have actually confiscated the property and the decision has attained finality and the information was not already with them the information was not in public record and um, the information was actually valuable leading to the prosecution and the finality or FPR's decision only then you'll get the reward anyway the reward is just to encourage uh, being a good Samaritan a responsible citizen we should all be able to report anyway so let's start with the actual act Benami tra uh, actual rules Benami transaction prohibition rules I've also opened up the act and the income tax ordinance because there are some cross references and I would like to show you those as well. So let's start with the rules now. Excuse me. So as you can see the date on the rules um, document that's been shared with you as a PDF file is 11th of March 2019. It was issued by the Revenue Division, Federal Board of Revenue of Government of Pakistan. And the SRO number is SRO 3261 of 2019. In exercise of the powers conferred by Section 61 of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act 27, Number five of 2017, the government, the federal government is pleased to make the following rules. Uh, you would have seen this uh, when we go through various legislation that there is always cross reference. This is a basic thing. Section 61 basically allowed uh, the federal government to make rules. The parliament gave that power to the federal government to make the relevant rule for this relevant legislation. But let me just quickly show you the section 61. This is the act. I told you I've opened it because there are some cross references and I wanted you to see how they can actually be cross reference and uh, just find out even if you have missed the previous session that what we are talking about. So here comes the section 61. And it simply states that the federal government may by notification in the official gazette make rules for carrying out the provisions of this act so the purpose the authority vested with who and the process to make the rules has all been mentioned and followed so this is the official gazette in which the government of pakistan notified so section uh, section one of the rules state 
simply the introduction that is normally the case with any body of legislative document it says short title and commencement these rules shall be called the benami transaction prohibition rules 2019 and come into force at once which means the date on this which this was issued so the rules came into force on 11th march 2019 now before we proceed i have a very very interesting question for you we are aware that the act was promulgated in 2017 and the rule only became relevant uh, sorry available they were all they will always be relevant unless superseded um they only became public and were uh, notified in 2019 so the question is that the act mentioned that the uh, benami cases uh, would fall within the purview of the act from the date on or after the date of the commencement of the act whereas the rules only came into being into in 2019 so now my question is can the benami questions uh, cases uh, since commencement of the benami transaction prohibition act 2017 be covered within the benami transaction prohibition rules 2019 and you simply have to answer that via the poll that is now appearing on your screen and you can select one of the two options yes or no and your time starts now i'll give you about 2 minutes to answer this poll okay very good we have started getting votes okay quick many people are saying yes but we have a good number saying no 13% 20% okay it's getting interesting and closer then the beginning and the demographic is constantly changing now about 27% are saying no and 73 yes okay carry on guys you still have 1 minute 20 seconds keep those uh, responses coming okay we have reached about 50 Eight seconds, and it's almost seventy-four to twenty. Okay. Nizam, the total is going haywire. I think that's a rounding error. Uh, maybe, sir. Okay, guys. Last thirty-five seconds remaining. come on guys come on the yes uh, group is winning at the moment they have casted 74% votes in favor of yes okay and uh, while we are getting additional votes it's largely staying the same come on guys vote you have your time last few seconds and then we'll close the poll and 5 4 3 2 1 and it's up so the poll results are um i think there is a rounding error because it's showing 76% as yes and 27 as no and that would go up to 103 so we can um, roughly say that about uh, 75% said yes and 25% said no <clears throat> okay the 25% who said no might have said that since the rules were not into being how can the cases attract them but remember the rules derived their applicability from the act and the act came into being in 2017 so any cases on or after the date of 2017 would still be liable to the legal purview so congratulations to the people who voted yes uh, because they voted correctly and congratulations still to the people who voted no why the answer was not correct because they got to learn something new and hopefully they would not forget this now so let's go back to the main body of the rules that we were discussing section 2 as normally is the case in many legislation drafts deal with the definitions it says that in this in these rules unless there is anything repugnant in the subject or context the act would mean a reference to the benami transaction prohibition act 2017 which is very common sense 
uh, very much a matter of common sense chapter would mean a chapter of the act section would mean a section of the act it's all common sense but law doesn't believe in only common sense it wants to have everything written down in black and white so words and expressions used but not defined in these rules shall have the same meaning as assigned there to in the trusts act 1882 succession act 1925 partnership act 1932 income tax ordinance 2001 anti-money laundering act 2010 and the companies act 2017 so um the rules might have terms which have been taken from these legislations but not defined herein and they would have the meaning that's been given to them in their respective original legislation drafts as being referred to here section three of the rules deals with the jurisdiction of administrator initiating officer and approving authority under subsection two of section 15 and this is being referred to the relevant sections of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act, which I've shown you already and a copy of which you would have. If you don't, send me a message on LinkedIn and I'll share that with you guys. Okay, guys, uh, this is very important because uh, now these modalities at times come really handy. If the authorities haven't uh, acted as per their actual jurisdiction, the entire matter can go haywire on technical grounds. So it is imperative that you pay attention and are aware of these modalities. So the board may, uh, subsection one of section three states, the board may by an order assign any commissioner in land revenue to exercise the powers and perform the functions of approving authority under the provisions of this uh, act of the act and the rules. Subsection 2 states that the board may by an order also can assign obviously any deputy commissioner in land revenue to exercise the powers and perform the functions of initiating officers under the provisions of the act and these rules. If you remember in the last session, I did tell you that the approving authority would be the commissioner normally and the uh, IO initiating officer. It's not the criminal or civil investigation officer, sorry, uh, criminals. Um, it is IU, same abbreviation, but herein the IU means the initiating officer. And as I mentioned to you in the last session, it would normally be the deputy commissioner by virtue of board's authority. The board may also by an order assign any assistant commissioner to exercise the powers and perform the functions of the administrator who would administer the property should the need arise. Section four, determination of price in certain cases. So you have to determine the price of a property or the transaction in dispute. Uh, it can be a movable or immovable property. Uh, we are certainly, when we are referring to the transaction or the property, we are referring to the Benami one. Don't lose sight of the context, what we are discussing here. Determination of price in certain cases, subsection one states that for the purpose or purposes of sub clause B of clause 15 of section two, the price that is a reference to the main act. The price shall be determined in accordance with the provisions of section 68 of the income tax ordinance and rules made there under to the extent applicable under the act. Now you can see how the rules are referring to the main body of the law, which is the act. It is constantly referring to the sections of the act. And I've already shown you how you can cross effort to income tax ordinance. But since determination of price is such a critical element, and I believe till now we are right on track in terms of time, I'll just quickly show you what we are talking about. So uh, section four of the rules has stated that the price determination shall be in accordance with the provision of section 68. So let's have a look at the section 68 of the income tax ordinance. So section 68 deals with the fair market value and that's on page 118, which should be roughly around 142. There you go. Section 68 fair market value. Now remember, this forms an essential part of determining the values under the legislation that we just referred to. So while this is from the income tax ordinance, now it forms a part of the relevant rules because it's been referred to here as such. 
so um, in essence basically for the purposes of this ordinance fair market value of any property rent asset service benefit or perquisite at a particular point in time shall be the price which the property rent asset service benefit or perquisite no surprise for qualified accountants would ordinarily fetch on sale or supply in the open market at that time and if you can recall this is exactly the definition you have been studying throughout your lives of an arm's length transaction which is the fair market value the far uh, the fair market value of any property or rent asset service benefit or perquisite shall be determined without regards to any restriction on transfer or to the fact that it is not otherwise convertible to cash if there is any restriction you'll assume there is no restriction and what would be the fair market value then and that would be the value that would be the deemed value in case of a benami transaction or property where the price other than the price of an immovable property referred to in subsection one is not ordinarily ascertainable such price may be determined by the commissioner if there is no way no fpr value no market value then the commissioner has the discretionary power to determine the price and they can write down that under what mechanism they have determined it notwithstanding anything contained in subsections one and three the board may from time to time by notification in the official gazette determine the fair market value of immovable property of the area or areas as may be specified in the notification so this is a reference to the fpr values where the fair market value of any immovable property of an area or areas has not been determined by the board in the notification referred to in subsection 4 that we just discussed the fair market value of such immovable property shall be deemed to be the fixed value the value fixed by the dc district officer revenue or provincial or any other authority in this behalf for the purpose of stamp duty so you can safely say if you don't have the fair market value the fpr value then you'll resort to the dc value or uh, the values notified for the purposes of stamp duty in respect of immovable property um, okay this is just uh, a formula it forms the essentials anyway you have seen more of or less uh, how to determine the fair market values so i'll revert back to the rules now and before we talk about appointment of chairpersons and members for it uh, of the adjudicating authority now is a good time to take your questions you'll have about 30 seconds to start typing in your questions and i'll answer them meanwhile you can see nizam if we already have any question that's not been answered you can read them uh, fawad has mentioned that he missed to the last session don't worry fawad you'll receive quarterly email um, about all the sessions that are being done and there's also another way you can uh, uh, actually uh, make use of this uh, resource basically the aim has been to allow you to develop your skills your professional abilities and yourself during these uh, uncertain and very rare uh times that we are currently going through of the covid 19 pandemic um, on a sideline we hope that you are taking all the necessary precautions and staying home unless uh, necessary and even if going out for a necessity taking all necessary precautions so the aim has been to allow you to have this uh, facility to convert this uh, pandemic the free time that you certainly find uh at your disposal convert that into a blessing by uh, providing you all these resources so in lieu of this uh, um, recordings of these sessions as well as other cpds would also be available on my social media channels uh, mostly people prefer to use youtube so you can go on youtube and you can just type in my name umar zahir meer and you can see all the videos there they are available to you uh, you can uh, go to them um, if you have missed any session you can actually uh, uh, catch up on that if you want to look at uh, the training for maybe another session you can look at that 
Uh, similarly, ACC also has a channel at YouTube, but now the recordings of these channels, to my knowledge, are not uploaded there. They are instead uploaded at a different platform, which would also be shared with you. So if you are more comfortable with that, you can avail that. If you are comfortable with YouTube or you are in a rush, you want it more quickly, uh, in a few days time you can go uh, subscribe to the channel and I would say one thing don't just keep it to yourself spread it in your circle knowledge is a blessing share it with your colleagues with your friends everyone let everyone help develop their professional skills so together we can give back to the profession and the wider society at large um, if you have any query even after the session you can engage with me on social media the best way to reach me is on linkedin i'll be sharing my contact details though so do we have any questions by now so we have a few questions sir okay, uh, the first one being from mohammed wasim akhtar Mm -hmm. uh, who should we report these frauds to if your line manager is involved as well? FPR. You will go find out the relevant uh, officer at uh, FPR. Better to disclose them and meet them in person first rather than uh, just sending simply a letter to them. Next one. Mohammed Saqib Rafiq, how will it be uh, ascertained that FPR did not have that information which was whistleblowed? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, Wasim, it's our national duty. Being a good citizen, we should be doing it anyway. Whistleblowing incentive is just what the name says, an incentive. However, to answer your question, the FPR will tell you that and um, normally it would be tougher for them not to say the right thing because everything needs to be documented i'm not saying there are not ways to get around that but um, that's the process at the moment and we should hope that especially with the younger professional lot coming in uh, the things are changing at the various national institutions including the text man hope that answers the question next one Rashid Hanif, sir, actually, who make these rules, Federal Government Revenue Division or FPR? Well, uh, the purview is with the Federal Government and Revenue Division is a division of the Government of Pakistan. And FPR is a department within that uh, division. So it is like you have a company, ABC Private Limited, and ABC Private Limited has Division A, which is at Department X. So when a department X releases something, who has released that? Obviously your division and the company both, department X is a part of them. And the company asked the division to ask department X to do that. Make sense? Great, next one. Uh, Hussain Rashid, Hadi. Hang on, hang on. Rashid, don't be so gloomy. Uh, it actually brought um, smile to my face after listening to my answer about who uh, uh, the whistleblower thing rashid said so in other words no rewards i would say to you and reward or no reward do your national duty though i'll hope that you'll be getting some rewards next uh, Hussain hadi i would like to ask if a person buys uh, the property due to uh, any reason register the property to his family members can it cover in benami property a beneficiary of uh, the asset is someone else who had purchased the property and had its documents uh what was the name of the person who asked the question hussein hadi hussein sub uh, it's a very good question um i think but I think perhaps you missed out the last session, but don't worry inshallah the recording will be available on the YouTube channel next week And in fact a new video is being made public on it every day. So go check it out uh, This question was discussed extensively um, 
we have a limited time today but i'll try to do one thing if at the end of the session we still have some time left just remind me about your question and i'll answer this again but otherwise you can see the recording of the last session unfortunately you won't be able to ask live questions there but these questions have been answered there so you'll get a good idea plus your knowledge of the entire act would be updated as well even after watching the session uh, recording, if you feel you need to consult or get some guidance, send me a message on my LinkedIn and I'll be more than happy to answer you. It might be that I might not immediately respond because I'm busy with so many things, but I make an effort to reply each and every one. Sometimes the load is a lot and one or two message might get buried, but send me a reminder and I will get back to you. Next one. I'm Mohammed Ijaz. Uh, Benami transactions prohibition rules 2017 will only be apl applicable within Pakistan. What about the properties abroad? Well, Pakistan only has jurisdiction in Pakistan. Na? For property abroad, we have different set of rules. We have Anti-Money Laundering Act. Uh, we have collaborations with other countries. We have FATF. We have international watchdogs. We have a NAB that's functioning there are many platforms for there next one rao ali zishan uh, have a, has a input for us uh, one can approach the fpr intelligence department uh, rather than going to find the cid slash dcit where no reference has been filed yet uh, you can approach the FBR intelligence department, but a separate department has been created out of the BTB officers and FBR claims that these are some of their best officers uh, that were available and at their disposal. So these are the officers who would actually be investigating. So I think uh, a more practical approach would be meet the officer too. And when you share with the officer, a copy should be served to FBR intelligence too. So you cover both the theoretical and the practical basis. Hope that answers the question. And thanks for the addition, Rob. Next one. Um, Babar Ali, if a person having a lot of lots and shops with heavy value, but is his income is too low uh, and not matched with his assets, a person is non-filer, whether this will be considered as Benami property? Uh, what you have described alone would not. It would fall under Section Triple One. Undisclosed uh, income and asset rules would apply on it, and uh, there are serious repercussions for it. These can still be Benami, depending on whether they meet the conditions as described in the Benami Transaction Prohibitions Act. If you want to discuss something specific, I don't think this is appropriate forum, uh, neither due to time restriction and because we have to take everyone together and the topic. We have to stay relevant, but also for confidentiality. So again, approach me on my LinkedIn profile, send me a direct message there, and I'll respond to you. Next one. Okay, so those will be all for now. Fantastic. So we have answered all the relevant questions, uh, which is pretty good. And it means that we can go back to our presentation okay so let's continue from where we left off subsection 5 uh, subsection uh, uh, no no we have already covered subsection 1 of section 4 section 5 appointment of chairperson and members of adjudicating authority secretary revenue division shall forward to the federal government a panel of suitable officers who are qualified as per criteria provided for in subsection 3 of section 6. Now, which section is this? We are only in section 5. So, which section can this be? Act or here? The rules. Come on, guys, think. Section 6 does not have any subsection 3. It is referring to the main legislation of Benami Transaction Prohibition Act. And if you attended the last session, you could remember that. Let me show you too. This is the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act. And this is section 6. And you can see that subsection 3 of section 6 mentions the qualifications for the relevant position. 
to be a chairperson or member of the adjudicating authority so in line with these requirements somebody who qualify as per these and is an officer of the federal board of revenue uh, their names would be forwarded by the secretary revenue division to the federal government for approval and the federal government shall then notify them appoint them and from amongst that panel the federal government shall appoint one chairperson and as many members as it deem fit for the adjudicating authority so section 6 deals with the terms and conditions of the service of the chairpersons and members of the adjudicating authority will also be discussing that what would happen if uh, somebody resigns or if the number is not complete uh, due to these technicalities would the proceedings be deemed null and void or the proceedings would retain uh, their sanctity let's find out so first things first for the purposes of subsection 1 of section 10 the chairperson and members of the adjudicating authority shall respectively be entitled to the pay allowances and other balance uh, benefits as mentioned here so everything is uh, being made quite transparent the chairperson would have pay allowances and other benefit as admissible prior to his appointment under rule 5 of the pay allowances and other benefits admissible immediately before his retirement and in addition to that pay allowance and benefit that officer was already receiving they would get an additional monthly adjudicating authority allowance of 300000 so if somebody was previously getting uh, say um, 3 lakh 4 lakh something like this whatever then they'll start getting an additional 3 lakh they would still get their old package and this by virtue of being appointed on this position and the members in addition to their previous pay allowances would receive a monthly adjudicating authority allowance of 200,000 so basically they have tried to make this as lucrative as possible while remembering the services rules uh, to ensure that people uh, would focus on their work and uh, would feel that their financial needs are properly taken care of section 7 deals with the provisional attachment um, in the act we have discussed that the investigating officer uh, can forward to the officer uh, their reasoning and the case they have made and uh, go for the provisional attachment and later on there can be an extension in the attachment anyway for provisional attachment the initiating officers shall provisionally attach any property in the manner provided in part 2 and part 3 of chapter 16 of the income tax rules 2002 so basically that deals with how the properties are normally attached a notice is sent etc etc and that similar process would be used in the case of the provisional attachment for the benami properties or transactions section 8 perhaps one of the most interesting section because it deals with the confiscation of property under subsection 1 of section 25 god forbid the worst case scenario for anyone okay uh, by the way before we proceed do you guys think it's a just punishment to confiscate the property in addition to imposing a fine and prosecution with the jail term Usman Parvez is saying yes, okay. Muhammad Khan is saying yes. Muhammad Ijaz is saying no, okay. Um, okay, I'll take one yes and one no. So, um, can you open up uh, Muhammad Ijaz Saab's mic so we can speak with him? Assalamu alaikum, Ijaz Saab. Please get ready. Unmute you from yourself so you can speak. Okay, we are getting yes, 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 Kailash, yes, Vasi, yes, Mojis, yes, Vasim, yes, Zeshan, yes, okay. Uh, Mohammed Ijaz, uh, could you unmute yourself? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam, Ijaz sahab, how are you? I'm fine, sir, what about you? I'm very well, thank you. Are you enjoying the session today? Uh, sir, exactly. How's the lock, lockdown treating you? 
staying at home or going to offices not sir yes uh, get, uh, not getting to office at home sir okay great so ijaz sir you have said no that this is not a just punishment why Sir, sir, I think uh, the confiscation of the property and uh, just uh, imposing 25% of the uh, value of the property as a fine is not, is not uh, uh, as a fair punishment hmm. because uh, uh, this property might have been uh, got through tax evasions or money laundering or corruptions, and if uh, just confiscating that money or uh, and uh, making a 25% uh, uh, fine, uh, how can this be? Justify this oh. could be more than that because this this is only uh, the uh, money we are getting uh, the uh, public money getting back from that person. So you want it to be they, even tougher. But have you forgotten the yes. prosecution and jail term? It's not just the confiscation of property and the fine. There's also the provision of prosecution and jail term. So three pronged. Yes, sir. I, I, yes, sir. I, I exactly know is the one the one to seven years. Okay. So what more you want to kill them? <laughs> what 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 else do you want? I mean, uh, the property at, is at least, at least the fine is being imposed, and they are sent to the additional to the confiscation to the fine. Mm -hmm. so, Go ahead. Uh, but I, I I guess there should be a hundred percent. Uh, I suggest there should be a hundred percent fine in, uh, equal to the property value, the confiscation of the property, and uh, less uh, not less than fifteen years of the. Uh, jail. Okay. Okay. Thank you very if much. There is, if there is, there is no deterrent of the law, uh, rules or uh, punishment, uh, how, uh, how the people will doing uh, stop doing that. Okay. Fair enough. That's a good perspective. Thank you, Ajaz sir. Okay. Uh, so basically, Ajaz sir said no, but he was a yes. So he his no meant that this is too lenient. Um, okay. Let's take. The first one who answered live, uh, that's Usman Parvez. Uh, Nizam Sab, can you unmute Usman, please? Uh, Usman, you need to unmute yourself, please, and uh, we'll be able to ask the question. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Usman, how are you? Alhamdulillah, sir. Good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Good to have you in the session today. Thank you, sir. It's are my pleasure. Enjoying? Yes, sir. I'm definitely enjoying this. Okay. Now yeah. let's uh, come to the point, Usman. It's great you are enjoying, and that's our aim. Um, you have listened to Ijaz Saab. He says, no, no, the punishments are too lenient. But you, along with the majority, are satisfied. So why are you satisfied? Don't you think Ijaz Saab is right? It should be even tougher. No, sir. I think uh, it should not be much tougher. Because there is a limit for everything. No? There is a limit for every punishment. Mm -hmm. So it should so it should not be up to you know more than the fine or something that you can uh, you know control the property. That is the correct thing. I think. Okay. Unless it is a, I think it. It is enough up to the fines and penalties. It should not go beyond this. Okay. Unless this this not this one one thing. If uh -huh. it is not paid, it so is not we can paid go for that. Like, son is you know, I mean to say, deliberately not paying. He can pay, but deliberately not paying. For example, you know, then in that case, that is exception. Otherwise, he should not. Okay, fair enough. That's a fair view. Uh, thank you, Smansab. Thanks for your feedback. You can mute yourself again now. Okay, guys. So you have uh, the perspective of uh, the representation of uh, our learned attendees. Let's go back to the main body that we were discussing, the Benami transaction prohibition rules. So are you guys ready for perhaps one of the most interesting sections of the rules? Section 8 deals with the confiscation of the property under subsection 1 of section 25. It states that where an order of the confiscation of property under subsection 1 of section 25 has been made, the adjudicating authority shall send a copy of the order to the approving authority. 
where an order referred to in sub rule 1 has been received by the approving authority in respect of any immovable property, he shall, the approving authority in this regard, shall forthwith direct the administrator to proceed to take any or all steps mentioned in this sub rule. Issue notice to the concerned authority of the federal government or a provincial government or a local body or an authority or any person or officer who is responsible for recording the registration of any property. Uh, so it could be uh, the different um, private societies uh, or it could be uh, the relevant patwari, etc., etc., or maintaining its record of ownership as the case may be having jurisdiction for the purposes of registration of such immovable property, intimating them that the property has been confiscated under the act and arrange to place a copy of the notice at some conspicuous part of the immovable property, which is visible to all clearly for the benefit of general public mentioning clearly there in, in English and in vernacular language, which is the local common language that the property has been confiscated under the act and vests absolutely in the federal government. Rule three, um, sub rule three or section as you want to refer to it, uh, where an order referred to in sub rule one has been received by the approving authority in respect of any movable property, he shall forthwith direct the administrator to proceed to take any or all steps mentioned in this sub rule Forthwith issue a notice to the authority or person having the custody of such movable property informing them that the property has been confiscated under the act and sell the property if the property is liable to speedy and natural decay or the expenses for maintenance are likely to exceed its value with the written approval of the concerned adjudicating authority and deposit the sale proceeds in the nearest government treasury or branch of the State Bank of Pakistan federal treasury or in any bank branch of national bank of pakistan in fixed deposit and retain the receipt thereof as evidence provided that where owner of the property furnishes fixed deposit receipt of state bank of pakistan or federal treasury or national bank of pakistan equivalent to the value of property in the name of the administrator the approving authority may accept and retain such fixed deposit receipt as a security and would not need to sell the property then. Provided further that where the movable property is a mode of conveyance of any description, the approving authority after obtaining its valuation report for the motor licensing authority or any other authority as the case may be, may accept and retain fixed deposit receipt of the SBP or the federal treasury or NBP equivalent to value of the movable property as a security in the name of the administrator and won't need to sell it then and cause to deposit the property consisting of cash government or other securities or bullions or jewelry or other valuables in a locker in the name of the administrator or in the form of the fixed deposit as the case may be in the SBP or in any branch of NBP and retain the receipt thereof. Basically, it's telling how to deal with all the various types, immovable property, cash, uh, convertibles, um, uh, movable vehicles, Cost to get the property in the form of shares, debentures, units of collective investment schemes and instrument to be transferred in the favor of administrator and issue a direction to the bank or financial institution as the case may be to transfer and credit the amount of money to the account of the administrator where the property is in the form of cash in a bank or the financial institution. And this is all done by the approving authority directing the administrator to do this. Whew. So quite detailed here. Now, uh, before we talk about receipt of confiscated property under subsection one of section 26, do you have any questions about anything that we have covered till now? If you have any questions, I'll be giving you 30 seconds. Uh, if we don't start receiving any questions, I'll assume that you are understanding everything. And we need to go back to the main presentation. Okay, so let's see, 30 seconds. Do we have any questions?
सो निजाम आठ थर्टी सेकेंड अप येट Thank you, sir. Uh, we have an old question from Mohammed Dijaz. Okay. Uh, he says many companies get a confidentiality clause signed from their employees. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the way of overcoming whistleblowers? Yes, whistleblowing is being legally protective. Uh, so no matter if somebody get you to sign an illegal deal that would not hold in the court of law so for example if somebody get you and to sign agree an agreement that you'll kill someone because the act in itself is illegal by signing an agreement it would not get any legal sanctity so if a company ask its employees to sign something that is to cover up something illegal or to do something illegal first as a professional we should not do that Secondly, if it's a generic thing and we are not aware that it's something illegal and we sign and they are employing this to protect something illegal now it would not hold any sanctity in a court of law. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Rao Ali Zishan, what if the property is used for providing essential services like banking, healthcare, etc. Uh, Rao sir, you also attended this session on the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act. Did you anywhere see any mention of exception that if the property is providing essential services, then it can continue to be a Benami? So this is like a smuggler get caught and donate the smuggling proceeds and uh, would that make uh, the crime legal? No, it won't. So as the law stands right now, it doesn't matter what the purpose is that is being carried out in the property at the moment it would still be regarded as a penami if all the other conditions are met and the treatment should be similar uh, there can be a provision mean the government might continue to provide those services in uh, that property but that's a different debate as far as the law, law is concerned it's pretty clear in this regard next one please Vakast uh, Rafiq, um, I have a question regarding the property. Mm -hmm. Recently, a Sark Dar property is seized. Is this the same case, Penami property being captured by the government? Uh, no, Vakas, uh, I have to go through the details, but uh, as I can recall, it's because he is an absconder. So that's a different law. If somebody gets a bail uh, and then they don't um appear before the court of law and become ex absconder the court delivers several notices and reminders there's a detailed procedure then they ask their guarantor etc etc if everything else fails then they start attaching their property plus uh, mr dar also have some nap cases so it could be due to either of those but i am pretty confident because we are keeping very up to speed with the Benami case laws, etc., everything, it wasn't about a Benami property, as far as I can recall. Hope that answers the question. Next one. Zishan Majib, can the person pay the amount instead of property being confiscated along with fine? No, the property will be confiscated because there is a cash 22. No? The property value will keep on increasing. But if you want to appeal, you want to do something like that and you couldn't do that before and you don't want the uh, property to be disposed. Meanwhile, you can pay that amount, provide the deposit slip as we discussed, and it would act as a security and they would not dispose of the property. Next one. Mohammed Vaseem Akhtar, once proved, what will be the treatment of Benami property? We have covered that in detail and that's what we've been, we've been discussing. It would be confiscated by the government in addition to the possibility of the fine as well as the prosecution and jail term. Next one. Muhammad Anas Elias. Hi, a person receives inquiry notice and asks about and ask about to tell about the property that has been sold four to five years back. Is there any time period defined law defined by law regarding which you have to provide evidence for no for benami uh, there is no time bar uh, however i think unless you haven't attended the last session on the act we discussed this in detail and i mentioned 
uh, that um, the senior legal partner, managing partner of our firm, of the legal side, Mr. Zahir Ahmed Mir, who's been ex uh, legal advisor, Federal Land Commission, and a very learned personality, has filed a reference to the Lahore High Court on a point of law, which is that um, um, FPR is practically using a concept of continuing um, crime. Um, it's an alien concept to Pakistani law, but it's been used in some judgments. Um, uh, judgments of the nature that have been called into question, uh, some uh, constitutional and political judgments, let me put it that way. So FPR is trying to use that and say, even the properties that uh, were transacted and purchased before the enactment of the act and were not disposed of on the date of the enactment of the act would fall within the purview. If that happens, then all the effective time bars are removed. Otherwise, uh, our understanding and belief is that the purpose and intention of the act is to only prosecute from the date of act and henceforth. And it does make a sense. A crime cannot be a crime if it happens at a time when it was not described as a crime. Otherwise, where would it end? You will keep on making laws and declaring previous instances as crime. So for example, Today, you can declare your property at FPR value. Tomorrow, a law comes that says declaring a property value at anything less than market value is a crime. Fair enough. But that should be effective from that day onward. No? If they say no, it would be implemented from any time in the past. That is a constitutional violation. You would say, well, I acted in line with the law that you told me was in existence. I was a law abiding citizen. How can I be uh, punished for something that was not a crime there? So hope you understand the point there. Anyway, with regard to providing the records, there is no time bar. Hope that answers the question in pretty much much detail. Um, Hadi Hussain, property of deceased person comes under Benami property, Pashima. Uh, property of deceased person? Uh, it depends if all the other requirements are met. It can be a Benami. Being deceased does not mean that the property cannot be Benami. However, it makes it uh, less likelier unless there are specific reasons to be investigated. But there's nothing prohibiting it to, from being investigated. Do we have more questions? We have two more questions. Okay, that's uh, good. First, we were not getting questions. Now we are getting a lot of questions. But this is good because that's the best way to learn anything. Carry on, please, Nizam. Nuruddin uh, Bahmani. If someone purchased Benami property, will purchase be penalized? If someone purchased Benami property, will purchase be penalized is, I believe, what he wants to ask. Obviously, when the Benami property will be transferred if this is during the investigation period it can't happen and if it is transferred uh, then there is a possibility that uh, um, actually this is a very complex scenario you have to give the specifics uh, because the answer would differ so for example nuruddin and by the way it's a good question um, so for example nuruddin sir if let's say that uh, you purchased a Benami property while it's being investigated. And for some reason, the investigating officer hasn't yet attached the property. Now, obviously, you would be in the line of fire. Let's say you purchased it when it was not being investigated, but you were aware that it was a Benami property. You would again be in the line of fire. So there have to be the specifics and different scenario might yield different answers. Hope that answers the question. Next one. Uh, Rao Ali Zishan, what about accounting reporting of fine paid by a company in connection of a Benami transaction? As Benami transaction was never on the company books, how external auditors would view it? Well, um, it's not purview of today's topic, but it's a good question. I'll just give you a hint. Being a qualified accountant, you have been levied a fine for a fraud. Now imagine how the external auditors will view it. The risk assessment would shoot through the roof. The sample size would increase many fold. The cost of audits 
and the likeliness of a qualified opinion would definitely increase so there are many considerations that would need to be seen how it would be booked cash would go out of your company's account and the fine as an expense would be booked simple next one Nuruddin said yes uh, we answered his question okay good to know and then Nuruddin thank uh, you are welcome Nuruddin please continue uh, Hussain Hadi, can you please repeat the conditions of Panami property? Yes, I can. But the question is why I should? <laughs> did you not attend last session? Nizam, how many times did we discuss the conditions in the last session? Many, sir. Uh, actually, I believe Hussain Hadi uh, just joined today. He wasn't with us in the previous sessions. Okay, the recording of the previous session will be available. Um, again, I've mentioned the YouTube channel. You guys can subscribe, search my name, Omar Zahir Mir. You'll have the recordings there. But okay, um, as a courtesy, I will share this. But henceforth, please focus only on today's session, the relevant question. So, Hadi Sab, especially for you on your request, the prime conditions for a Benami transaction in crux are that the property should be in another person's name who is not actual beneficial owner. It should be paid by someone else. And the person who paid for it would either currently or expect in the future to receive some benefit. So these are the prime conditions. Then it's quite a detailed discussion. There are different proviso. What will happen in case of blood relation, in case of uh, your uh, descent direct descendant or ascendants uh, the condition to have joint accounts etc etc but the prime is what i discussed with you and i hope that answers you tala is saying how to view the other webinars of acc later um i think tala must have joined us later because i discussed this in extensive details acca send you email on quarterly basis uh if you want to see it quickly um then on my youtube channel and social media you'll get the recordings in a few days time uh if you prefer youtube go there search by name my name and you'll have all the recordings i think we have answered all the questions right nizam we have sir fantastic that's good let's go back to the main body of rules then so uh reset of confiscated property the administrators shall at the time of receiving the confiscated property ensure proper identification of property with reference to its particular is made in the order under subsection 1 of section 22 and with the approval of approving authority establish one or more warehouses for the safe keeping of attached and confiscated movable property okay that brings us to the question how to manage the confiscated property only the properties where the management expenses are expected to be very high or where we expect that the value might decrease or where um, there is a rational reason as we have already discussed we can dispose of the property if these conditions do not apply and we are we mean fbr officials the government officials are not disposing of the property then the question should arise that how would they manage the property what could they do with it and how to go about that let's find out so uh, sub rule one of rule 10 says where the property confiscated is of such a nature that its removal from the place of attachment is impractical or its removal involves expenditure out of proportion to the value of the property administrator shall arrange for proper maintenance and custody of the property at the place of its attachment one prime example would be a house how would you detach the house so you have to ensure for the proper maintenance and custody of the property if the property confiscated consists of cash garment or other securities bullion gold jewelry or other valuables the administrator shall cause to deposit them for safe custody in the nearest government treasury or a branch of the national bank of pakistan or the state bank of pakistan the administrator shall maintain a register for recording details in respect of such movable assets as cash, government securities, bullion, jewelry, valuables that they have deposited. The administrator shall obtain a receipt from the treasury or the bank as the case may be against the deposit and retain them. 
and shall maintain in respect of immovable property a register containing the details in the form as specified in part two of the first schedule of this rule of these rules which i'll show you in a bit but how to dispose of a confiscated property where the federal government has directed that the property vests under it in terms of subsection 3 of section 25 and it should be disposed of under subsection 3 of section 26 the administrator shall arrange the disposal of the property in the manner as provided for same in the income tax rules 2002 to the extent applicable under this act okay before we proceed let me share with you our experience so far we have seen that the officers uh, deputed under benami are very hard working they are competent many of them no 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 uh, most of them have a good repute of honesty um, however, one odd thing is that because they have the departmental pressure, um, if you have started investigating and you have used sufficient resources for that, it becomes so much difficult to go back to your senior and say what you should in that instance because you are in a position of trust and if something is not liable as per law, you should be able to go back and tell that. But that's in theory. Unfortunately, in practice, we have seen it's very challenging. So uh, that's one area where the government would also need to see that even genuine cases, uh, which are not Benami otherwise, but are investigated, uh, would uh, possibly have to go through the appeal process, consultants, etc., to get out of this hole. Uh, so while it's very admirable that we have such a legislation to curb the menace of uh, money laundering and illegal monies, but we need to make certain provisions uh, in terms of safeguarding the uh, genuine people who actually haven't committed a crime. Okay, uh, let's move forward to rule number 12, which deals with the next forum. Okay, so the case has been decided against you and the property has been attached and all that. What can you do? Do you have a relief or not? What would you do? As we discussed in other session and more so in the last one on the Benami Transaction Prohibitions Act, uh, Benami Transactions Prohibition Act 2017, our constitution allows judicial remedy. It allows a person different platforms to appeal and the judicial rights. And same is the case in this set of legislation too. So an appeal can be made to the federal appellate tribunal as the first instance and sub rule one of rule 12 states that an appeal to the federal appellate tribunal under subsection one of section 44 shall be filed in the form as specified in part three of the first schedule to these rules which i'll show you this uh, the form under sub rule one shall be accompanied by a fee of 1000 rupee uh, it's pretty much the fee that you file for filing an appeal with the commissioner appeals that we have discussed in one of the CPD sessions of this scenario. So basically, um, all these numbers in this document is normally referred to as rule like rule 12, rule 13, and the subsections are referred to as sub rules. So whenever you see a reference to a section that is mainly to the main body of law, the Benami relevant section of the Benami Transaction Prohibitions Act. So subsection 1 of section 44 means, as we have already covered under the rules, a reference to the relevant section of the Benami Transaction Prohibitions Act 2017. Just a quick reminder. Anyway, sub rule 3 of rule 12, the form under sub rule 1 shall set forth concisely and under distinct head the grounds of objections to the order appealed against and such grounds shall be numbered consecutively and shall specify the address of service at which the notice or other processes of the federal appellate tribunal may be served upon basically the correspondence address on the appellant and the date on which the order appealed against was served on the appellant where the appeal is preferred after expiry of a period of 45 days effort to end subsection 1 of section 44 it shall be accompanied by a petition in quadruplicate four copies duly verified and supported by the documents if any relied upon by the appellant showing cause as to how the appellant had been prevented from preferring the appeal within the 
period of 45 days now before we go through the terms and conditions of the service of the chairperson and members of the appellate tribunal i think this is the right time to actually show you these relevant forms so have a look now first schedule part one this is uh, how the officer would maintain the record of the management of the confiscated property register so they'll put an order number date of receipt of property description of the property if it's movable the quantity amount and estimated value uh, name and address of the benamidar and beneficial owner if his identity is known name and address of the treasury or bank where the properties are deposited for safe custody date and time of deposit of confiscated properties in the treasury or bank receipt number with the date of receipt obtained from the treasury or bank remarks of the administrator signature and name with date and seal and that was for movable property what if they have retained some uh, they have confiscated some immovable property it's pretty much same uh, there are some minute differences depending on uh, due to the nature of the property being immovable so there would again be the order number order mean the relevant order that was issued to confiscate the property uh, the date of receipt of properties, description of properties. So in case of land, the area, survey number, plot number, location, and complete address. In case of a building, the house number, location, and complete address. Name and address of the Ben Amidar and beneficial owner, if his identity is known. And then remarks of the administrator, followed by his signature, name, date, and seal. And the seal would also come in the register for movable property. And now um, we will discuss how the appeal is lodged the form of appeal to the federal appellate tribunal and after this i'll take a quick q a break so now is the time to start writing your questions if you have any in the q a section in the question section that you have in your panel for the webinar so part three under uh, rule 12 sub rule one we have the form of appeal to the federal appellate tribunal it states under section 44 of the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act 2017. Obviously, you'll be filing an appeal under that. From mention the name and address of the appellant here, and it would be addressed to the registrar of the Federal Appellant Tribunal. And then you'll have the address of the Federal Appellant Tribunal. The above name appellant uh, hereby prefers his appeal under section 44 of the Benami Transaction Prohibitions Act 2017. Again, you have to mention the order number and its date passed by the adjudicating authority, the name address of the adjudicating authority. Normally, their designation address is sufficient, but enter the name if you have under the said act on the following facts and ground. And then for facts, you'll mention the brief facts of the case. So practically, there is not enough space. So you assign the paper as an enclosure detailing all the all the facts and the copies of any annexures the relevant documents to support the facts that you are mentioning similarly you'll mention any grounds on which the appeal is preferred again you can mention that on separate papers obviously you'll have one would have detailed grounds if they are properly prepared and you won't have enough space in the form so mention them in the separate uh, document and enclose that as an enclosure and cross reference in this section that the grounds are as per enclosed document x uh, of pages a to z whatever and then it would uh, mention the prayer that in light of what is stated but above the appellant prays for the following relief and then the reliefs out specify the reliefs out and then the declaration that the fee payable for this appeal as mentioned in sub rule 2 of the rule has been deposited in the form of demand draft with the registrar federal appellate tribunal you'll put in the address the signature of the appellant you'll mention the receipt number and date and the name of the appellant and then you'll sign an oath that i the appellant do hereby declare the facts stated above are true though the best of my knowledge and belief mention the date on which they are verifying sign put their name list the document as enclosure mention the place where you are signing this and the date and that's it and what you can do you can actually form this appeal in the same pattern that we have covered in the uh, cpds on filing the appeal to commissioner appeal and appellate tribunal and those pattern 
amended appropriately to address this can also be used and the good news for you is that both of those sessions are available on the youtube channel let me even show you so uh, this is the youtube channel uh, you can just write my name here and you'll get this channel omar zahir mir so click on this channel and then click on the videos you can also click on the search bar and search uh, directly um, i've logged in as an uh, admin so i can even see the videos which are yet to be released for you every single day from today uh, the today's video has already been released but every single day all the way till 18th april every day at 12 in afternoon a new video will be released on this anyway uh, what i was referring to here is the recording of the session on filing an appeal to the appellate tribunal you can click this and listen to it in detail that should come in really handy similarly um, filing of an appeal to commissioner appeal you also have this session here you can play this and learn from it so you have all these resources at your disposal make use of them now before i continue with the rest of the rule in fact we have reached pretty much the end of the rules uh, the final rule rule number 13 i think this is the appropriate time to hold the q a session um and the poll too so i think uh, what we can do is um we can uh, just quickly do a poll and let me also show you another thing so if for example you want to um see accs channel um the reason i showed you my channel is because acca now normally upload uh, the CPDs on a quarterly basis, as uh, I've been told by Nizam. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nizam, and that is on the on specific platform go to webinar. But we have ACCA Pakistan's uh, channel here. You can also see this channel. Uh, you mostly now have the latest videos on uh, brand recognition and development, but you do have a good collection of accs webinar and past cpds these include my videos and videos of other trainers as well on different lectures so you have uh, one of my video appearing one of other person's video appearing uh, but these are past videos i think they mostly belong to 2017 or so so you can also avail this as a resource to uh, just a quick heads up to you guys anyway uh, let's quickly conduct a poll and after the poll we'll answer your questions so you can uh, keep typing in your questions if you haven't done so now that we have almost reached the end of the rules the question that we should ask yourself ask ourselves and you as professionals should ask yourselves is do you think that these binami transaction prohibition rules 2019 adequately cover the practicalities of dealing with the binami cases if not why not and I will be taking some feedback from you. So do think while you are answering. Again, you have two options of yes and no, and your time starts now. And again, you'll have two minutes. All the best. Happy voting. Okay, we have started receiving votes, and most of the people are saying yes, and it has changed no from a mere nine jumped on to 25 back to 17 very interesting okay okay and back to 20 so uh many people think it's not adequate okay very interesting we'll be asking them why though a clear majority about 80 percent says no this is sufficient okay okay guys uh, about 44 seconds have passed now and you have about one minute and 11 seconds left now come on guys make your voice heard do vote while they are voting nizam our next expected session is on which topic value proposition and 
uh, let me check, sir. Sure. And earning power. Okay. So, guys, I had a head start for you. Uh, you would be um, receiving an email from ACCA about the next session, which is expected to be early next week, inshallah. And that is on a topic that interests many, many, many of you. And we continue to receive many queries. How can we earn more? How can we uh, deliver value? If I'm doing my job, my employer is not appreciating. Why not, et cetera, et cetera. So that session will be answering all that. I have taken a few seconds of yours. So I'll be giving you some more time. Come on, guys, vote in the poll. Make your voice heard. We have received about uh, just under a third of participants vote. The time is limited. I won't be extending it much more. Just 30 seconds more. So make your voice heard. Come on, guys. Do you think these rules are adequate or not? Nizam, you can also cast your vote. You are also ACC finalist. Uh, organizers and panelists may not cannot uh, vote <laughs> can i show you a magic sure sure let me just make you vote so what do you think are these adequate or not in your professional opinion and the poll ends now uh, i think it does uh, for now but um, as president uh, president said uh, and for those not said uh, we'll we'll for future we'll get more coverage uh, in the act as soon uh, as we move ahead uh, Nizam, so I'm, this, uh, I, I, I feel i'm rubbing on to you the nature of your answers are changing now <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> a very very professional answer um okay first of all before i comment further the result of the poll 80% have voted that yes, we think that the Benami transaction prohibition rules 2019 are sufficient, are adequate to address the challenges. About 20% believe that no, these are not adequate. The thing is this, uh, yes, these are adequate for now, but the challenge that we will face, this is a new law. This is still very much in infancy stages. It would develop, there would be case laws, and we can see that the law would develop. Thereby, the taxation authorities, by uh, virtue of the powers vested by the federal government in line with whatever the parliament would pass, would be adding, deleting, or making other changes to these rules. I can foresee that. So I think the answers of both uh, group that voted yes or no, can be deemed correct in their own perspective. Uh, I had promised to take feedback from one participant on each side. So I have covered the crux. Uh, you won't be allowed to say what I said. You would have to tell me something additional why you voted the way you voted. Um, can we just uh, unmute any one person who voted yes, Nizam? Allow me some time, please. Sure. Meanwhile, guys, keep your questions coming because after this, I'll be answering your questions. Okay, guys, I'm giving you about one minute while Nizam is searching uh, to unmute our participants. You can type in the questions if you have any, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. And if you have no questions, then that one question that was left unanswered, I'll answer that. The one question that was not directly relevant to say so. Okay, uh, seems that I cannot uh, extract who voted yes or no. 
So, uh, okay. Um, then is it? We can ask members to yeah. uh, push in. Um, can you just uh, type in yes or no? that whether you voted yes or no, and then Nizam would uh, have to pick and choose any one member from either side. So please just type whether you voted yes or no in the poll. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, we need some people who voted no as well, please. Okay, uh, let's do the first uh, no one. Muhammad Sharif Saab. Could you please unmute Muhammad Sharif, sir? He's unmuted. Assalamu alaikum, Sharif, sir. How are you? Walaikum oh, salam, sir. Umar. I'm good. What about and hope that you are fine as well. I'm very well, sir. Thank you. Uh, where have you joined us today from? Which city? From Lahore. Fantastic. Are you staying at home or going to work? No, we are staying home. Taking precautionary measures. That's very good and wise of you, sir, and very responsible. So you voted no, and uh, that means you don't believe these rules are adequate. You can't say what I said. Uh, in yes. addition to that, why do you think these rules are not adequate? One thing I observed that uh, uh, the cost which will come in maintaining the property, especially the immovable one, uh, who will be charged, who will eat that expense? And secondly, the estimation value which will be conducted uh, only on part of the officer. Uh, there are uh, major chances that uh, it can be manipulated. So what are the checks and balances on that? Okay, that's, that's a it. very, very good observation. What do you do, Sharif Saab? Well, uh, I have uh, eight years experience in UAE. And Gosh, now I'm in my company as a uh, interior designing firm in Lahore, THA. Interior design. Was my brother is interior designer. An accountant so, in interior yeah. designing. Wow. <laughs> no, actually, I am <clears throat> I am uh, heading the uh, support role, side. basically the HR and the finance side. Okay. So he is the technical guy. Okay. So the part is there. Okay, that's fantastic. We wish you all the best, sir. Thank you for your feedback. Thank you um that's great so a valid observation basically what sharif sub said is number one um as the law should the law hasn't specified who would be bearing the cost of maintenance though it's common sense but it needs to be specified in black and white secondly where there are no values available the commissioner has been given the officer has been given the authority to actually uh, prescribe the value which is highly subjective both are valid consideration well done sir now can you um nizam now i will give you this right to choose anyone who has answered yes and kindly unmute them of course sure sir okay seems like the person i uh, chose is not attentive so i'll be selecting someone else um come on you are a military family guy your decision making power should be strong quick okay so zishan majid uh i'm unmuting you uh please unmute yourself as well great assalamu alaikum zishan can you hear me
uh, you are there Zeshan so uh, you need to unmute your mic it would be appearing on your webinar participation panel let's wait for 10 seconds if Zeshan couldn't do it then you can uh, unmute uh, Kamal Asghar or Sakib Ali Rashti sahab Sure. Okay, let's do that. Hello, can you hear me, sir? Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Wa alaikum assalam, sir. How so are you? Am, I'm very well, and who am I speaking to? Zishan? Yeah, this is Zishan, sir. Zishan Majid, yes. Okay, what happened, Zishan? Where were you lost? No, actually, sir, the mic was not unmuted by the organizer, so I was trying to. It was not popped up because uh, the icon was dull at that time. Ah, now okay. it's it's fine. Okay, that could be internet lag. Um, <laughs> how are you today? Sir, I'm, I'm I'm great, thank you. Great, great. <clears throat> Sub, you voted yes that you are satisfied with these rules and you have listened to my conversation with uh, Sharif Saab already. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think? Why are you satisfied? Because uh, uh, initially uh, the law does cover maximum aspect. What Sharif Saab said uh, can be interpreted by by the uh, by the further clarification and all, but as I'm concerned, a lot of aspects have been uh, covered in this act, and I've attended your uh, live uh, um, um, conference at uh, Lower Chamber of Commerce once, and uh, after that, I've, I've been studying this law, and I think it does uh, cover quite aspects of the real uh, matters in our, you know, okay. uh, professional life too. Okay, yeah. so basically to sum up, you are saying that in your opinion, it covers all the essentials and the minute things can later on be uh, addressed via clarification, right? Mm, I think we have lost Seishan. Uh, 